giveaway. What ideas we got? What are we pushing? What content are we making? Because, y'all, it's, it's go time. Man, I'm thinking about putting out some flyers, okay. go around the city, invite some people. I think that'll be really great. That's fine. And do some like BTS, some of us having yeah. it out there. Definitely, right? yeah. I think yeah. that'd be a great idea. So, I actually have an idea. Oh. Pastor Lewis has been showing up to our creative team meetings, and it's been a little distracting. Oh, let's hear it. Yeah, so uh, remember back in the day, I used to do those those fun, everybody loved them, those, those peace videos? What peace videos? Apparently, Pee had these minimally successful Easter invite videos. Cringy then, cringy now. So, uh, Pastor Lewis came into Studio A today to give a creative idea, I guess, but to be honest, what was he even doing in there? Like, I understand he used to do it way back then, but it's new and renovated. You know, like, the Gotham peeps, like, all the, the red videos <laughs> I used to do back in the day. Wait, uh, say that again? Like, Gotham peeps, no. and they're fresh off the box, never stick, like, <laughs> uh, no? No. I literally just joined the creative team and I've never seen P. Lou in a meeting. And he comes in talking about this video and I've never seen it before. So I don't know what he's talking about. Did we do that last time? No, like, so like, I, so hold on. So you, you guys aren't just seeing it. So like oh, I have peeps, peeps and like, you know, cause you were, we're inviting our peeps to Easter. And then there was a year where it was 2020, you know, everybody was inside, so I had my peeps on Zoom. Peeps on Zoom. Yeah, like, so we had to do, like, the online services. Like, we were watching on, on, like, Zoom, Zoom together. Peeps on Zoom, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you made a music video during COVID? Y'all don't remember this? No. No. You've never seen this. No, but, like, did, every, everybody loved these. It was, like, super popular. Like, well, maybe because it was, like, COVID. <laughs> it was not much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could probably pass them out. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's that's idea. Idea. oh yeah, I met the peep, like, here's a peeps, join us. No, no, but that's the, that's the point of the video. Maybe, you, guys, you guys just argued it. Maybe I'm not explaining it right. I don't know. I think you, you explained it. it. Yo, how about this? I'm, I'm just going to shoot the video, and then, then you'll see. The great turn of the peeps. Return of the peeps, return of the peeps, and we're saving them a seat. Return of the peeps, return of the peeps, return of the peeps, and they're filling up the seats. Pilu! Return of the peeps, and we're saving them a seat. Is he recording a TikTok? You know, I was, uh, when he first brought up the idea of peeps, I was, I was kind of skeptical, man. Everybody in the room hated it. Uh, and then we watched the video and yo, I'm trying to be on the remix. because he has risen. Come on. I was buried beneath my shade. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my Till I met I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met You called my 
joining us for Easter Sunday. Shout out our youth who are here leading the way of worship. I love y'all. Thanks so much. I wasn't expecting that. I don't know why. Well, as you guys take your seats, go ahead and tell your neighbor your outfit is good today. Come on, worship team, looking nice today. I told worship team we're going to shoot a music video after this. I don't know what we're doing, but we're going to do it Maverick City style. So y'all hang out for worship. Oh, oh. 
we got some people who are down. I don't know. I'm just saying we got some cameras. We could do a thing or two. <laughs> oh, who's down for that? Y'all got to keep coming back to be a part of that. Well, whether it's your first time or your hundredth time, we just want to say welcome home. Okay, only like 30% of you did that, and it's the last service. So I could take my time a little bit longer this morning. So I'm going to need y'all to say it like you're actually excited that everybody is here joining us this morning, whether it's your first time or your hundredth time. We just want to say... There it is. Welcome home online church. We love you. We're so glad you are joining us this morning. Y'all, it's been a beautiful, amazing Sunday, 1045 a.m. service. Y'all better be lit because y'all got some extra sleep. Y'all had time to get some caffeine. So I better hear you saying amen and yes, Pastor, and that's good, and worshiping and praising the Lord today because it's going to be amazing. We have an amazing experience ready for you guys. And so as you took your seats, there are a couple things that are there. First thing is a flyer that says run to win. We're all as a church going to go jogging after service. Praise God. I'm just kidding. That's the next series that we have coming up starting next weekend. So make sure you join us for our new series, Run to Win. Only like seven people are excited. Everybody else is kind of scared because they heard about Hunger Games and they're like, I don't know what we're going to do this next series. That's all right. There's a calendar of events coming up. And there is also this connection card on your seat. Um, this is really important because we get to know your name. We get to know how to pray for you, how to celebrate God with you. There's going to be a QR code right up behind me that's going to come up. You can also scan that on your phone and fill out the form digitally. I'm going to give you 60 seconds on the clock and then I'm going to tell you what to do next. Next. All right, if you didn't have a chance to fill that out, that is all right. I saw some of you committed. Some had an iPad ready to scan. I said, okay, come on. They're about to fill, fill out the connection card. I ain't mad at it. So listen, I was just told that I didn't introduce myself. Hey, guys. Hey. My name is Jessica. I'm a servant here at Relevant Church. I'm so glad you are all here with us. Listen, being here at Relevant, we get to meet so many amazing people and just build community with one another. One of my favorite families, they got the cutest babies, y'all. They are the Kraft family, and we have a journey story. So why don't you check out their story We ended up being connected with Relevant through a mom's forum in the local area. We had been searching for a church for three months. It felt like ages. Yeah. I serve on the worship team, um, and I love serving on the worship team because it is a blast. Um, I feel like I get to be myself. Um, I think that... I, I, one, I love to worship and to be around a group of people that love it just as much as I do and they're passionate about it and when we make music together, um, it's honoring to God and it's, it's honestly one of the best experiences that someone could have here at Relevant. Since coming to Relevant, God has been at work in my life, um, just in teaching me to find my identity in Him. There has been so much healing and growth that has happened since coming into Relevant. Even just my third service here during the worship, I can remember feeling God come to me in 
in a close way that I haven't felt in a long time. But sometimes you just, you're still searching for that personal relationship with him. That's not just um, like a checklist. When we were like in that service, there was just a moment of healing when I felt God say, like, I'm right here and you're going to grow and you're going to heal. And there's so much future for you that's promised in our family. I would strongly encourage you to come in with open hands and no expectations and let God meet you. We're the, we're the Chris, Chris and, and this, this is, is our journey story to relevant. Come on, can we celebrate the Kraft family? I love that she said during worship, before the message even started, God was ministering to her already. And that is what we are believing for you today as well, that the Lord will do something new in your life. Y'all, we get to impact so many families, just like the Kraft family. Um, through our giving, we are able to hold a space where people can come in and encounter the move of God and see their lives be completely transformed. There are multiple ways to give. There's a giving envelope on your seat. You can give online to giving.thisisrelevant.cc. Text any amount to 84321 or give via Cash App or Venmo. As you prepare your gifts, let me pray. God, thank you so much, Lord, for moving and flowing through families that we are seeing lives transform, generations change. Lord, may you bless today. May you bless the people in the room who are giving their seed into continuing to build your kingdom. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How many of you know that the storms will come? The rain came a wind blue but my house was built on you i'm safe with you i'm gonna make it rain came rain came a wind blue but my house was built on you I'm safe with you, I'm gonna make it rain, came rain, came wind, but blue, but my house was built on serve a God who loves us so much that he wouldn't leave us in our mess, but he gave us his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. And three days later, early Sunday morning, somebody say early Sunday morning, he rose and we serve a risen king. So let me tell you, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through in life, no matter what hardships you have, no matter what trials you have, Jesus is the firm foundation. 
you can lean on him, the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for your faithfulness through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that we all get to gather here and celebrate on this Resurrection Sunday the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one whose name is above every name, Jesus. It is in his name that we all say amen, 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 and it is so, amen. What's up, church? How y'all doing this Easter Sunday morning? Come on, y'all to 1045. Y'all gonna need some energy from you guys. Listen, for the 8.15 and the 9.30, I had to temper my time, but this is 10.45, so if I can preach a little bit, if y'all okay with me preaching just a little bit, okay, it's five of them. Everybody's like, no, we got Easter plans. Hurry up, Pastor. Hurry up. Hurry up. We got to get home. My name is Muta. I get to be one of the servants here at Relevant Church, and at Relevant, there's one thing we want to do, and we want to do it well. We want to help everybody around us discover that Jesus is relevant. And because Jesus is relevant, we want to create an atmosphere where we learn to passionately follow Jesus, love across boundaries, and make a tangible difference in our community, our region, and our world. And listen, if you're looking for a home church, if you're like, man, I need to find a place that I can get connected, get in community, learn about Jesus, connect to God's mission through my life, we want to invite you on the journey with us. This morning, this Easter morning, we are going to be in two primary texts. The first one is Genesis chapter 2, and the next one is going to be Revelation chapter 22. We're going to be at the beginning of the Bible, and we're going to go straight to the end of the Bible. Genesis 2, verse 8 through 9, says this, Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees to grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Notice God plants a tree and multiple trees in the garden. He plants two trees, primarily the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of of good and evil. Then when we go to Revelation chapter 22, in the very last book of the Bible, we read and it says this, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. I love this because this has given us a picture of two gardens. In Genesis 2, we see the Garden of Eden. And a lot of Bible translations, when you look at the top, and there's a header, it'll say Eden restored. Eden restored in Revelation 22. The Bible begins and ends in a garden. Genesis 2, God plants the garden. Now it's interesting because in the beginning, God creates by speaking. When he speaks, he creates something out of nothing, ex nihilo. But when it comes to Genesis chapter 2, it says that God gets his hands dirty. He forms man out of the dirt of the ground. He then plants a garden. I don't know about you, but I am so glad that we serve a God who's willing to get dirty. You may not have a testimony like I do, but I know that I was dirty, busted, disgusted, and have no place in God's house. 
But God, being faithful in mercy, faithful in grace, decided to come down and save a sinner like me. Take me out of my dirt. Take me out of my muck and mire and say, Muta will be saved. And he restored me, brought me back to new life. I thank God that we serve a God who doesn't mind getting a little dirty. In Genesis 1, we see God as a creator. In Genesis 2, we see him as the gardener. Then he places and he commissions Adam to join him in keeping and protecting that garden. Soon enough, when we read in Genesis, we find that Adam fails at his task. He sins against a holy God and turns his back on his creator. And Eden becomes no longer accessible to Adam. Adam has lost his place in Eden, and God removes him. Later, we see a second Adam, Jesus, that would restore the garden. Right now, in 2024, we are in between two gardens. The garden in Genesis chapter 2 and the garden in Revelation chapter 22. A garden is a patch of purpose, so to speak. I don't have a green thumb, so when I look at dirt, it's just dirt. But they're gardeners, people who love to plant and yield fruit who look at dirt a little differently when they see dirt, while I may see it simply as just a patch of nothingness, they see potential. Gardeners will then work to break up the soil. They will till the ground patiently, preparing it to produce a harvest. The gardener has to stay committed, doing what it takes, seeing it through so that when the fruit shows up, they can declare that it is good. With that in mind, let's take a trip to the first garden. After the creation of the world, the story of man found itself at its beginning, a place of endless beauty and perfection, vibrancy of colors in every statuesque tree and flower, a home of protection and safety, with all resources in abundance and excess, void of the ravage of time, sickness, or disease. This was the Garden in Eden. And in this garden, the account of the first man, Adam, was set in motion. The garden was given to Adam, and all things were under his dominion. Then, of his rib and dust, God gave Adam a wife named Eve. Everything in the garden was theirs to relish. They could take of any fruit in the garden to eat, all except for the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so they lived together in this enchanting paradise, enjoying the goodness of God. Until Satan came also. The cunning tongue of the serpent posed questions of division and doubt into the mind of Eve. Then a deadly proposition. Eat of the fruit and your eyes will open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Seeking knowledge, they ate of the fruit and their eyes were opened. Suddenly aware that they were naked, they departed and hid from God's presence behind a bush. It was in this moment that death was introduced to the world. In man's story, the end occurred at the beginning. I was born to be 
garden is a patch of purpose. And anywhere in your life where there's possibility, the enemy wants to attack it. Any area of your life where you have the possibility to become fruitful, there's the potential for the enemy to come and disrupt everything that you've been working towards. It could be your relationship. It could be your education, your career, your gifts, your talents. It could be even your emotions or even your faith. If you notice that the enemy was attracted to the patch of purpose, he wasn't invited. No one asked him to come. No one called the enemy to the garden. God placed Adam and Eve in the garden. And yet the enemy, the serpent, found himself there also. The devil is attracted to the area of possibility in our lives. It's like a magnet. Any place that is sacred and has sacred purpose, any area that is set for divine possibility, anywhere where God is at work in our lives. Scripture tells us in Matthew 13 that a man went and planted a field of wheat. It says while he was asleep, the enemy came and sowed weeds and tares in this field. The word of God is like seed, and when it's planted, the enemy goes on attack. That's why it tells us in Hebrews 12, 15, that we should not allow any root of bitterness to spring up in our lives. Sometimes you've got a dream. You've got an assignment. And the enemy comes and sows seeds of disorder. Before you know it, the area is tainted and it's working against your purpose. Satan is the garden destroyer. Two trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God tells them, don't eat from this tree. Because the tree of knowledge of good and evil had a knowledge that God did not create us with the capacity to be able to handle. See, the knowledge of evil is that which springs up when we're watching the news or when we're seeing the mess and the heartache that's happening all over the world or over our own communities, the brokenness, the war, the famine, the loss. We weren't created to step into or embody that level of brokenness. In our heart, we look and say it's not supposed to be this way. A knowledge that weighs on our heart when we see the abuse, when we see the pain, when we see death, when we see fear and we see suffering. But the tree of life, they could have eaten from this tree of life. And imagine having the life where all you see is pain and death and suffering. And you have to live that day in and day out perpetually for ceaseless ages. In an act of mercy, God removes Adam and Eve from the garden. And as he's removing them, I want you to notice something. He never removes Eden from them. Eden is paradise. It's a longing for perfection. See, when we're born with this knowledge, we know internally, innately, that it's not supposed to be this way. 
when you see kids playing and things happen that shouldn't happen, they say, it's not fair. It's not supposed to be this way. But as we grow older, we have this desire for perfection and paradise. And we grow and we believe that somehow we could be the exception. Surely if I can just find the right job. Surely if I can just find the right spouse or the right individual to date or I can find the right career or I get the right education or I can move into the right neighborhood or I can have the right house and the two kids and the dog and the white picket fence, surely then my life will feel full. But it doesn't take long to discover that even those things don't fulfill. And then disappointment sets in. Can I tell you, disappointment is simply this, a longing for Eden, a longing for perfection. We try to find it in people, we try to find it in property, we try to find it in profits, but we keep coming up short over and over and over, and here we are, Easter 2024, in the middle of two gardens, in a broken, dark, diseased world. God says, I've got to fix it. God would then send his son, which takes us to another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Millennia after the fall, there was yet another garden, Gethsemane. A far cry from the paradise of Eden, a garden of necessity, serving as a reflection of how far the heart of man had fallen into sin, this garden was void of the abundance and spirited life that grew in Eden. And so, in the midst of this garden was the last Adam the second man to come from heaven, but he not made from earth and dust, rather of man and God. It was here in Gethsemane that he held in his heart the choice to bear the cup of sin. The fate of the world rested upon his shoulders. Only the son of man could rewrite the story of man. Jesus, God's only son, the final Adam, come to take the promise of death and replace it with life everlasting. Then again, in this time of devotion, faced with the imminence of his own life ending, he made a choice. Jesus, the last Adam, came to succeed where the first Adam failed. Because one person disobeyed, many became sinners. But because one righteous person obeyed, many will be made righteous. And for our inequities, he bore the cup. He chose us. He chose you. you made. You made me and you don't make mistakes. I can be real with you. You take me just as I am. You choose me all over again. I am the one you love. I am the one you love. I don't have to prove anything. There's room at 
set your table for me. I am the one you love. I am the one you love. It's me, the real me. It's me, it's me, it's me. you're proud of me even though I don't deserve it sometimes no I'm not a perfect child but I still make my father smile I know you're proud of me oh you take me just as I am, you choose me all over again. I am the one you love. I am the one you love. I don't have to prove anything. There's room at your table for me. I am the one you love. I am the one. Your love never fails. Your love, your love never fails. Your love never fails. No. Your love, your love never fails. Your love never fails. Your love, your love never fails. Your love never fails. No. Your love, your love never fails. Your love never fails. It won't fail me, no. Your love, your love never fails. Your love never fails. You take me just as I am. You choose me all over again. I am the one you love. I am the one you love. I don't have to prove anything. There's room at your table for me. I am the one you love. I am the one you Gethsemane was the first place that Jesus would bleed. He wouldn't bleed from the beating that would rip his body and his flesh. He wouldn't bleed from the crown of thorns on his head. He wouldn't bleed from the nails being driven through his hand just yet the first place that Jesus bled was in Gethsemane. Have you ever seen a garden that's out of order? Things that shouldn't be there have now overgrown. That's Gethsemane. 
is surrounded by these things that shouldn't be growing. Jesus goes to Gethsemane to have an encounter with his father to pray. And he invites his disciples to come with him and intercede and pray for his behalf as he is in communion with the father. The story tells us that he goes and checks in on his disciples and those who should be praying are now asleep. The weeds of apathy are encroaching on them. Judas, who was one of his closest companions, one of the 12 disciples who had traveled and learned from Jesus over the last three years, has sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. The weeds of betrayal are present. Three to 500 guards show up to arrest Jesus. Weeds of injustice are present. Temple leaders are there to accuse Jesus. Weeds of accusation. Peter, in a fit of rage and anger with what's happening, draws his sword and cuts off the ear of one of the soldiers. Weeds of rage are in the garden. But it's interesting that Jesus is still there fixing brokenness as he fixes the guard's ear and restores him and heals him. Evil is all around him. It's not supposed to be this way. Disappointment is all around. We see him in the garden praying to the Father, and he falls to his knees, and he says, Father, if you will take this cup away from me, if there can be any other way. He's sweating drops of blood. I don't know if you're like me, but I felt like I've had my own times of Gethsemane where I've cried out, it's not supposed to be this way, where I've been disappointed by loss and, and pain and frustration. I did what was right. I, I did everything that I was supposed to do. I planned well, yet the weeds of disappointment are all around me. Have you ever been there where you proverbially ask God to take the cup away from you? I don't want to go through this level of heartache. I don't want to go through this level of disappointment. But in the garden, Jesus makes a choice. A choice to succeed where the first Adam failed. A choice that would lead to a tree. We know it as a cross on Calvary. See, at a tree, the first Adam would lose what God would give him. And on a tree, the second Adam, Jesus, would win it all back. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-given spirit. Adam, the first man, was an imperfect foreshadowing of the perfect spotless lamb to come. His story is bookmarked by a history of humanity and sin. The final Adam, Jesus a resolution to the legacy of countless generations, the first, last, and only residence of heaven on earth. His story is unending. A miraculous account of God becoming man to die on a hill that he created. 
The first Adam yielded to temptation in a garden. The last Adam defeated temptation in a garden. The first Adam tasted death from a tree. And the last Adam tasted death on a tree. The first Adam hid from the face of God. The last Adam begged God not to hide his face. The first Adam blamed his bride. The last Adam took the blame for his bride. The first Adam brought thorns and thistles. The last Adam wore thorns and thistles. The first Adam gained a wife when God opened man's side. The last Adam gained a wife when man opened God's side. The first Adam filled our account with death and sin. The last Adam cleared our account with life and grace. Finality. When Jesus took his final breath upon the cross, it was the end. When they laid his body to rest in that garden tomb, it was the end. But not the end that we could have known. The Son of Man rose again, the stone rolled away, and out of what was a dark, cold cave bloomed life and grace. The only finality, the only end was to sin and death. The final Adam, the son of suffering, Jesus defeated the grave. I hear a lot of people running their mouths. Every word like an anchor just bringing them down, down, down. We've all been looking for a silver line. Something to hold on when hope's been hiding. I know a place you can go if you want to find it. This is the good news. If you're breathing, it's for you. An empty grave, a life that has changed. It all points to Jesus' name. If you've been searching and nothing's been working, I've got good news. Jesus loves you. Come on. Open up your eyes and look around. This is a place where freedom is found. Take a minute, breathe it in, let your life turn upside down. This is the good news. If you're breathing, it's for you. An empty grave, a life that's changed. It all points to Jesus' name. If you've been searching more. Nothing's been working. I've got good news. Jesus loves you. Come on, come on. No matter what you bring. Oh, he's in love with you, no matter your history. Oh, oh he's in love with you, no matter your unbelief. Oh, he's in love with you from now till eternity. Oh, he's in love with you, no matter what you pray. He's still in love. Still in love with 
moment as we close out. Jesus goes to Gethsemane. He's tried. He's found innocent. Nevertheless, he's still sentenced to death. On the cross, we find him in between two criminals. And while the crowd is mocking and jeering, one of them has a moment of clarity and he sees that this Jesus is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. And he cries out to Jesus, remember me when you get to your kingdom. Remember me. And Jesus turns to him and he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Everybody say paradise. paradise. The word for paradise is garden. Even hanging on a cross, Jesus is restoring all that's been lost. And he tells them, today, you will be with me in the garden. The story goes on to tell us that Joseph of Arimathea comes and he asks for the body of Jesus. And he takes him down off of the cross, wraps him in his grave clothes and places him in a tomb. Three days later, Jesus would arise. And in John chapter 20, verse 11 through 16, it tells us this, that Mary was standing outside of the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her, because they have taken away my Lord, she replied. And I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus. But she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you've taken him away, please tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him. Mary, Jesus said, 
she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. The first glimpse we see of Jesus post the resurrection, he's the gardener. He's the gardener. She's not calling him the Messiah. She's not calling him the line of the tribe of Judah. He's, she's not calling him the great shepherd. He's the gardener. Think about all he's gone through, everything that he's defeated, but yet the first revelation of himself to us after the cross is that he is the gardener. Think about Mary. She's lost her mentor. She's lost her teacher. She's lost her friend. She's lost the apostles. She has to go look for them because all of them scattered at the crucifixion, and she has to go find them. She's also the first at the tomb, yet does not find Jesus. Weeds of disappointment and loss are probably creeping up. It's not supposed to be this way. The angels find and ask her, why are you weeping? Jesus asked, who are you seeking? See, because that's what disappointment does. Disappointment exposes the longing for perfection in our lives. Unfortunately, we keep running into letdown after letdown. Hurdles and disappointments and grief sets in and we begin to weep. Then we start seeking everywhere we possibly can. We seek perfection in people. We seek feeling in substances. We seek hope in anything that we can grasp for. We find Mary disappointed and grieving and weeping. A reminder that we are between two gardens. We're living between Genesis 2 and Revelation 22. All of us surrounded by evil, it's not supposed to be this way. All of us with our own level of disappointment, some of us in the midst of the disappointment in our life, some of us coming out of that disappointment, some of us annoyingly about to walk into disappointment, longing for more, longing for life to be full, but yet we look around and it's just weeds of sadness, weeds of pain, weeds of loss, weeds of failure, weeds of abandonment, weeds of pain. We have to remember that Jesus is the gardener. Jesus is the gardener. In Genesis, we are introduced to the gardener. At the tomb, he's the gardener. Because Jesus wants nothing more than to bring life to where there's been death. Frustrations and fruit, fruitfulness out of dirt. Purpose out of pain. He's the gardener. He just needs a patch of purpose. And that's your heart. All he's looking for is somebody who would dare declare, Jesus, if you are the gardener, here's my heart. Weed-ridden, thorny, dirty, hard, rocky. God, if you're the gardener, here's my heart. Here's my patch of purpose. And the resurrected gardener, he and he alone, through his love and his grace, can fill that emptiness, that void with love and perfection. Can you see his wounded hands being willing to get dirty? The Bible tells us 
that he sows the incorruptible seed of his word in our hearts. It says that he pours out his spirit like water over our lives. Jesus is the giver of life and he is risen and he is here. He knows how to heal. He knows how to give grace. He knows how to remove your guilt, your shame, and condemnation. But you have to give him your heart. You have to be willing to give him your patch of purpose. So I don't know if you're in this room and you've been carrying the weeds of disappointment, the weeds of loss, the weeds of pain in your heart. Jesus says, I am the gardener. I can restore. I can make whole. I can rebuild. I can bring fruitfulness out of your dirt. I'm the one who can bring joy for mourning, bring beauty for ashes, but you have to be willing to give him your heart. Are you willing to give him the patch of purpose so that he can lead you in the path of possibility. All heads bowed and all eyes closed. Maybe you are in this room and you need a gardener to come and cultivate your heart to break up the dirt, break up the rocky ground. The word says that he can take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Scripture tells us that anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Scripture also tells us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So in a moment, I'll give you an opportunity to respond. Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart and say, would you let Jesus in today? Maybe your palms are getting a little sweaty. Maybe your heart's beginning to race. Maybe the flood of memories of disappointment are coming up and God is saying, would you trust me? Would you lay them all at the foot of the cross? And let my son wash away your pain, wash away your shame, and make all things new. God is faithful. So on the count of three, if you're in this room and you're saying, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need renewal. Jesus, I'm ready to give you my heart, this patch of purpose. One, God loves you so much that he sent his son to come and sacrifice himself for your sins, for your pain, for your shame. Two, we're reminded that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Three, if you want to say yes to Jesus, just raise your hand and raise it high and say, Jesus, I give my heart to you. Jesus, I, I trust you as the gardener of my life. Jesus, I need you to come and restore me. Jesus, I need you in my life. Jesus, here I am. Here's my heart. Raise your hands high. Praise God. 
Now, everybody all together, let's pray this together. Yes, if you're online as well, too, put the hand raise emoji in the chats. We want to see your life renewed, too. Everybody, let's pray this together. Jesus, I give my life to you. Forgive me for my sin. Wash me as white as snow. Renew me and make me whole. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you're the risen savior. And today, I'm declaring you Lord over my life. The good gardener, take my hard soil and bring fruitfulness and gladness. Allow me to experience new life, life abundantly in this life and in the life to come. Jesus, I pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Come on. Can we give a hand of applause for Pastor Muta? Did y'all have a good Sunday today? Come on. I pray God moved. I pray he ministered to you. I pray healing took place for you this morning. We're so glad that you made it. If you said yes to Jesus, will you meet us in the lobby? We want to celebrate with you that you have come home. We're so glad that you spent Easter Sunday here at Relevant Church. If you're a first-time guest, you were entered in a raffle and have the winner of our relevant swag bag giveaway, okay? And if you're not in the room, I'm going to keep it for me. So you better come to the front, Miss Jasmine McNair. Come on, make some noise for Jasmine. She said, I'm getting my bag. Uh-uh, girl, you ain't keeping it. I ain't mad at you. You look beautiful. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We're glad you're here. Well, if you guys could stand to your feet as we close out our service and give our blessing. Relevant church, may you learn to passionately follow Jesus, love across boundaries, and make a tangible difference in your community, region, and world. Have an amazing Sunday, y'all. Love you guys. Good news. If you're breathing, it's for you. An empty grave, a life that has changed. It all points to Jesus' name. If you've been searching and nothing's been working, I've got good news. Jesus loves you. I'm not striving in my own strength, I'm striving in yours. I'm not trying to find my own way, I'm walking that course, not thinking about my own.